I'm Grandmaster Jose Torres, publisher of Action, and you're watching the Piff Connection. That family, peace and blessings, brother Ed Amoja. We're still here in Brooklyn, the Republic of Brooklyn. We have a unique brother here. I was told some stuff about him already. I have seen him several times. This is my honor. First time I actually interviewing him. This is Sifu Carl Albright. Um, and he's Sifu, so he's in the Kung Fu family, and he's down here. And I was told like you are one of the few people that I mean, um, Grandmaster Caulfield allowed to use this dojo. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's welcome him. So greet, greeting gr grand Grandmaster and welcome Sifu and welcome to the show. Thank you very much for your time. So let's talk a little bit about you and where you came from and what you do. Okay, uh, let's just mention about the titles. Uh, uh, the term Grandmaster uh, has been a, uh, has been given to me by some of the late Grandmasters, but you know I consider myself a teacher for first and foremost. Mm -hmm. So Sifu just really means instructor or teacher. Right in Chinese martial arts. And actually, it kind of means father, because you feel like uh, the people you teach are your children, and you're bringing them up in, in the arts. I've been teaching in New York since 1968. So I'm one of the very first uh, you know, martial kung fu teachers, and I'm one of the first Americans to even learn the Chinese style, Chinese martial arts. Right. <laughs> so the kung fu history, uh, I'm not only I know about it, I'm actually part of it. You know, I was there. That's interesting. Um, so you started teaching in 1968, so that means you've been, you were training before that. What made you um, pick Kung Fu over Karate? What, what made you pick that style? What styles did you, you learn? Well, I started out uh, as a kid. I started actually at five, when I was five years old. I was 1957, and my father was a colonel. So uh, being an army brat, uh, he was interested in Chinese martial arts because one of his friends was a, uh, a captain uh, in a British commando unit, uh, and he was captain of the Shanghai riot squads in China. And because of familiarity, familiarity with him, he decided to, uh, to give, you know, put me in martial arts stuff, and he kind of liked what they were doing. So I didn't know what I was doing at the time. I was a kid, five years old. What, what do I know? Uh, but I never stopped, you know. I mean, a lot of people learn martial arts. They come in, they go out, you know. I never stopped. So uh, until that time, since 57, I've nonstop, you know, continuing my practice. So what styles, I mean, there's several styles in, in Kung Fu. What styles did you train in? What styles do you teach? Okay, so that's uh, over 60 years now I've been doing uh, Chinese styles. So I started doing uh, Praying Mantis style originally. And uh, later, a style called Bagua, which is a diagram style. Uh, and I went to high school in Honolulu, Hawaii. And I, uh, they had a school there called uh, the Chinese Physical Culture Association. And they have different styles that are taught there, basically from the north part of China. Uh, praying Mantis, Northern Shaolin. Uh, and then I saw guys doing a uh, totally different style, a whole to totally different organization. I said, who are those guys? And they said, they're doing Hungar, Southern style. And the teacher of that uh, was Buck Sam Kong. So uh, I said, well, I'd, I'd be interested in, in learning that. Uh, I started with those guys. So I started learning Hong Kong with Buxom Kong. Uh, he introduced me to uh, his uh, Kung Fu uh, brother, uh, whose father uh, was one generation from Wang Fei Hung. Wang Fei Hung is considered uh, the current founder of the Hong Kong that most people do today. So that's, that's an interesting history. Um, as I'm listening to you speaking and the uh, different styles that you have learned, you, have t you were taught and then you have learned, what have, over your years of teaching, what have you found to be like a, the common theme for the young people you're teaching today? Okay, um, what I tell people is that, uh, uh, first of all, I, I tell everybody, I'm, a black, I'm black. <laughs> I'm black. I'll let everybody know that off the bat. And my wife will tell you, if you don't know, give them five minutes and you'll find out. You know, so, uh, and that's important because uh, my, since my complexion is very light, uh, half of my time was spent with my father in the military, as you split it with my mother, the other half of his time was spent in Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn. Okay. So, um, you know, I tell everybody, I travel all over the world, and I learned a lot of different things, but my number one uh, rule was, it's got to work in Brooklyn, all yeah. right? Republic of Brooklyn, <laughs> no sleep, no sleep, still Brooklyn. <laughs> and and that, that was that was the goal. So after learning all these different things over the many many years, uh, I you know basically use the principles of a lot of styles, mm -hmm. and I bring them uh, into the praying mantis style, which is basically what I focus on, the praying mantis style okay. from the north northern praying mantis. And uh, uh, see, praying mantis is the original mixed martial art. It was originally uh, combined 18 different styles together over 400 years ago. And it was the first time that was ever done. 
you know. So I tell everybody that's talking about, you know, MMA, I said, well, we did it first, mm -hmm. you know. And in fact, I do seminars at uh, MMA schools. And I go to Texas, I go to, um, I, was, I was doing seminars at Cross, uh, Cross Pit, which was founded by uh, Hackleman, who uh, had the MMA um, uh, uh, competitors, Tito Ortiz, you know, and, and some of the, uh, several other, um, um, you know, really big, you know, uh, guys. So uh, basically the, well, Chuck Liddell came out of there, for example, Chuck Liddell. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, my stuff is very practical. So my training in the arts, you know, kind of, it, it kind of got, yeah, it got more and more to the practical side of it. So I'm um, listening to you speaking and what we're doing here, um, Grandmaster Bill McLeod's having a um, gathering of the Grandmasters. And you know, I said to you before we went on, I said, you know, we usually, it's good to have these, but what comes next? So what would you like to see come out of this gathering today? Because we're in February, we're getting ready to go in March, so we're still early in the year. What would you like to see happen after this? Okay, first I, I'd like to mention that, you know, um, uh, uh, Grandmaster uh, Professor Bill McLeod, uh, we come from the same Marshall family, uh, in a sense. You see, because uh, before Moses Powell, there was Professor V. And as a kid, I used to train with Professor V. Professor, Professor V used to teach on Remsen and Atlantic Avenue. And we maintained a friendship for many, many years. Oh, he's got, he's got, all right, my brother. So uh, a lot of what, what uh, is taught today uh, by Professor Bill uh, and the Sanukas uh, people come from Professor V, from Renda Vista And Professor V was also a kind of guy that liked to mix the martial arts up. He learned some Kung Fu, he learned Jiu Jitsu, he learned Arnis, you know, he learned a lot of different things. So uh, even though my style is, you know, Chinese driven, you know, I've had experiences with other things and, and, and we, Professor Bill and I are still in the same uh, family, you know. So uh, uh, as we, as you were saying about the um, uh, the seminars and so forth, and the youth today, I think that the uh, the traditional type of Chinese martial arts uh, they have a lot to give to the youth because today's um, trend is toward MMA, obviously. Mm -hmm. And while there's nothing wrong with the fighting aspect of it, uh, there's uh, there's something wrong with the respect aspect of it. You see, because everybody's uh, trash talking. I don't know if you saw Conor McGregor, he's throwing a chair at a bus. And, you know, I mean, uh, 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 you know, that's the first thing you learn as a martial artist. You learn respect. respect. And you have to respect your teachers, you have to respect your family, respect yourself, you know. And so uh, that's what's missing. And, and I think that that's what's also missing in the youth culture, you see. Uh, uh, there was a time if you were on a bus, a bunch of kids would be on a bus and, we'll, and people were cursing and an older person would say, hey, watch your mouth. Say, oh, sorry, you know. And today, of course, you know, it doesn't happen, you know. And so uh, the respect aspect of it, it really is very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, the martial arts, uh, you know, traditional martial arts, they push that respect. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important for our community today. So that's, so you so hopefully you're looking to see more of a respect aspect come out come out of here and, and taken to the streets because I was talking to Grandmaster Anthony Muhammad and the other, I said to the the mental the physical and the spiritual the spiritual is, and the mental seems to be weighing and the, everyone's f a lot of people focus more on the physical but you know the physical gets damaged if the mental and the spiritual is not there so w how do you see for you being in it for 60 years where do you see those three aspects right now in the martial arts uh, uh, away from that you talk about MMA but okay well you see the uh, part of what comes with disrespect is is emotional baggage you see so uh, what happens is like hey what you looking at you see so while that's disrespectful it also has a lot of emotional baggage behind it you know and it brings emotional baggage so what you looking at so now it's not just that we just said that you see, so we all bring our emotional baggage to it. So now we're not just fighting, we're fighting from an emotional standpoint, you know. But by having, uh, by learning self-respect, self-discipline, and self-control, uh, you're, not, you're not emotionally, you know, pulled into that, you see. So if somebody uh, calls me something, you know, somebody says something to me, I can say, you know, okay, you know, whatever, I can let it go, you know. But if you come at me, I can take care of myself, right. you see. And a lot of times uh, uh, that might just be enough, you know. Uh, I don't have to escalate, gotcha. you see. But uh, a lot of times, the people have to prove something to themselves and to each other. See, so by you saying something to me, I have to say something to prove to you that I'm this or I'm that, you right. know. And uh, and now that that's not saying that sometimes that's not necessary. Uh, what it's saying is that sometimes you you need to know the difference, mm -hmm. you know, of when uh, that might be beneficial to you or it might not be, you know. Uh, sometimes you gotta let people, you have to let people know I'm not the one. 
Okay, so you gotta let people know that, yeah. and then it might be enough. Be you enough. know, that might be enough. Uh, but it, there, there are ways to do that. But I also find that as a person who is uh, competent and mm-hmm. alert, mm-hmm. Uh, that co- sort of keeps you out of out of trouble. Absolutely. All right. One of one of my greatest, um, I guess, uh, benefits in uh, uh, work in work mm-hmm. uh, in New York is I worked for 32 years in the New York City subway system. Wow. So a lot of people don't know uh, about that and. Uh, I've been written, in, written up in newspapers. I've taken over 100 weapons of people in the, on the trains. I've been in the Post. I've been in the news. Mm-hmm. I've been in several newspapers uh, ab- about that. And and um, obviously, the the only way I could do that is by having a lot of control, you know, a lot of control of myself. See, emotions get you cut, they get you shot, they get you, you know, because, you know, control. I mean, if a guy says something to me and I run out, he might have a knife. He might have a gun, you know, you see. But by having control and by uh, uh, looking at a situation and trying to say, look, do I – Need to diffuse it with my uh, talking, or do I need to do something physical? You know, and uh, and now it keeps me in a, in, a, in a sort of third party way of looking at it. I'm looking and seeing what's going on, you, you, you see, and I can and I can control. You know, uh, so uh, otherwise, you know, you're so uh, 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 so connected and you're so driven and so concentrated that there might be somebody standing right next to you, his friend, who punch you in your face, and you never even saw him there. Yeah. You see, so many times pe- you might be arguing with one person, but really you're fighting five, and you don't realize it. Exactly. You see, because you were too emotionally attached to it. Mm-hmm. You see, so mm-hmm. part of martial arts is to give you that confidence and to give you that control, so that you can see what's going on. Mm-hmm. You know, you see a bunch of guys on the street corner and they're pushing each other around and swinging it. You know, you shouldn't walk through that. Right. Just walk around. Walk around. Just walk around. You, you see. Got nothing to prove. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You see. Yeah. So, but the more confidence you have, the more you believe that, and the more you understand yeah. you have nothing to prove. Yeah. And then once you understand that, then you know it'll yeah, save you a lot that, of. That diffuses that situation for you yourself personally. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. See, this is this is why we're talking to the grandmasters. You're hearing different perspective, a lot of things. But the one thing you're hearing a lot is about respect. I think that's that's a common theme I'm hearing from all the grandmasters today is about respect uh, and and knowing who you are, and what you can and cannot do. So I'm gonna have um Sifu Albright give his contact information so people could actually um reach out to him. And you know, talk to them if they want to. So, how can people find you? Um, find your dojo if you're still teaching. How can we find c- contact you? Okay, you know, I tell everybody if you Google my name, Sifu Carl Albright, you know, your computer will break because I'm easy to find. You know, and uh, which also I tell everybody that has a problem with me. You know, because obviously you do run into some you know issues once in a while. And I tell everybody, I say, look, I'm easy to find. Uh, I'm on Facebook, Sifu Carl. My email is Sifu Carl at gmail.com. You know, so Sifu Carl is the easy way to find me. So you're still yeah. teaching here in New York? I teach a private group, but I do seminars. And I travel around. I go to Texas. So I go to California. I do seminars. So I'm around. I, I do a lot of So like I always tell my people, you are um, passport ready. Right, exactly. I'm definitely passport ready. <laughs> Well, well, Sifu, um, the family who's listening, I want to thank everyone for paying attention, watching what we're doing, because this is not, this is not about Ed Mojo. This is about the grandmasters and how can we expose you to some grandmasters you might not even know about, but you have seen their work through other people, their students. So please feel free to reach out to these grandmasters, and we will be talking to a few later on. So this is Piff Connection for the Action Martial Arts Magazine. Brother Ed Mojo, Sifu Carl Albright, thank you so much, sir. Appreciate it.